Welcome to Coming from Left Field, where we have conversations about politics, books, and current events with your host, Greg Gottles and Pat Cummings. Today, we'll be discussing the 2018 book, How Democracies Die, by political scientists Stephen Levinsky and Daniel Zeblatt. As Paul Krugman states in his New York Times review, How Democracies Die documented how this process has played out in many countries, from Putin's Russia to Erdogan's Turkey to Orban's Hungary. Bit by bit, the guardrails of democracy were torn down as institutions meant to serve the public became tools for the ruling party, then were weaponized to punish and intimidate that party's opponents. On paper, these countries are still democracies. In practice, they've become one-party regimes. And now on to the podcast. Hi, Greg. Welcome back. Good Hi, to see you. how you doing, Pat? Good to, Good see, to you again. see you again. And I uh, thought today we'd talk about a book that I really liked, Democracy, How Democracies Die by uh, Levinsky and Ziblatt, a couple of Harvard uh, uh, professors who have studied change and how democracies through the years either succeed or don't succeed and what the uh, ingredients are with that. And I really like this book and uh, sent it to you and thought that you would enjoy it too. And lo and behold, you said that <laughs> you had some you had some um, problems with it, so let's 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 discuss that a little bit. Sure, sure. Um, you know, I I was unenthusiastic about this book. I read it, I read it carefully, and uh, you know, if, if your definition of propaganda is you start with an ideological disposition and then you build a case around it and share it with the world, this is propaganda because it's essentially an anti-Trump document. That's what its essence is. And certainly the world needs, and we on the left need another book attacking Trump. You can't attack Trump enough, but you have to have some, some principles in your attacking it. And here in this book, I think uh, the authors really get off the track. And the only definition is offered in the last two pages. And it's a, uh, it's a, uh, a, a quote from E.B. White, which is uh, very, very trite, very uh, common and has no real rigor to it. So you read the book and you wonder what they think a democracy is. Is it a state of affairs? Is it a structure? Is it a process? What is it? They never say. They assume, I guess, there's a popular definition and they go from there. That's a, a serious weakness of the entire project. Um, the other thing that, that kind of signaled to me that this is a book, work of propaganda is the first four pages are devoted to um, blurbs, to endorsements of the book from across the ideological spectrum, everywhere from the very left, not the very left, but the left, left center, all the way to the right, the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, and everything in between. Uh, so it's an establishment book, and the target is Donald Trump. I wish there were more depth to it. I wish there were more breadth to it. I wish there were a more careful study of history than there is. So I wasn't very happy. So what did, what what attracted you to this book? Well, it, it is a it's it's a series. It's a book in a series. Uh, I think that a lot of people came to Trump's presidency and then stepped back and they, what were the the books about the psychiatrist that uh, uh, tried to analyze him? Uh, the book on uh, t the steps of tyranny. Uh, there have been a lot of authors that have tried to make sense of this, and I, I get the feeling this was written a year after he was in and in his presidency, and they were trying to make sense of it too. So I, th this is kind of what I, why I liked it, is that they indicate in the book that when authoritarians, and again, that's kind of nebulous how you define authoritarians, yes. Yes. but when authoritarians kind of gain power uh, that there are a template of what they say are um, tests for identifying the authoritarians that are going to cre create problems with the with democracy and that those steps 
seem to perfectly parallel what we were seeing with Trump. Now I can assume that those steps were also, if these guys are academians from Harvard, were also very much at play with what was going on in, uh, in their other examples that they were uh, describing where democracy died. And, and these are rejecting democratic institutions. Well, Lord knows Trump has done that. He's, he's uh, tried to, um, the way in which he's diminished the civil service systems and the court systems and so forth is quite, quite prominent. Denying the, number two is denying the legitimacy of your political opponent. Well, you've got lock her up with Hillary. You've got all this Biden stuff with his son. Uh, these are not, these, these people are not just your opponents. They're horrible people that deserve to be incarcerated. Um, tolerating and encouraging violence is the third point that they say. And this was both in his campaign and in the manner in which he spoke in all of his rallies and it leading up to what happened January the 6th. If that isn't a, you know, that's a perfect example of how you not only tolerate, but encourage that. And then curtailing civil liberties and trying to figure out ways of uh, controlling your, the people you don't like by using legal and using, in this case, bar uh, to uh, try to neuter and diminish the power of your um, opponents through curtailing their civil liberties. So I was, that's why I kind of liked, I thought, oh my gosh, this is just a, this is an outline. This is what happened. These guys are right on top of things. And it, well, it's, let's, so go ahead and tell, what, what do you think about that? Well, let's take those four, those four criteria. Sure. And let's, let's go back to perhaps the most democratic moment in American history, the American Civil War. Nothing democratized America more than our Civil War. It took uh, uh, a political system controlled by backward planners, by reactionary slave holding planners. It took that system and overturned it and democratized this country, gave us a sense of equality that we never had before. It took the words that were in the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, and put some meaning into them. And let's drop a figure like John Brown into those four items. Okay, John, John Brown did not respect institutions. He understood the institutions were working against social justice and against democracy. He, didn't he, he wasn't going to put violence aside because he saw the only way to correct these institutions was violence. And it turns out he was exactly correct and so on and so forth. So if you take each of these four things, our two Harvard professors would have said that John Brown is like Donald Trump. And I think that's a serious misunderstanding of American history and social justice, and most importantly, what democracy in its essence is, what it is in its essence. It certainly doesn't fit this story. This is a, a, a deeply conservative account of what democracy is, in my view. So you don't see any parallels with these steps with Erdogan in Turkey or uh, Orban's Hungary or any of the other places where there were democracies and they ended up cr uh, crumbling and they tended to have these this outline, didn't they, to a certain extent and how they, you well, know, you see, Putin I, and Russia, look what's going on with the, you know, his it's, opponent. It's easy, to it's easy to seduce Americans into, into going along with that because We've been taught from the cradle that democracy is essentially uh, a structure, an institution, a procedure, if you will. Now, in other words, you have rules, you follow the rules, the playing field is fair, that's okay. That doesn't, that doesn't capture the essence of democracy at all. In fact, a 10th grader understands it far better. If you told a 10th grader, we're gonna play baseball and we're gonna play by the rules, and the distance between the bases is all gonna be the same, correct. Use the standard ball. We're gonna have imp umpires there who are gonna make sure everybody plays by the rules. But you pit the Chicago Cubs against a little league team, that's not democratic, that's not fair, that's not just. They understand that 
but this book doesn't. Everything turns on outcomes, democratic outcomes. You could have a perfect democratic structure and have everybody enslaved. We had one until 1861. It was a, it was a structural institutional democracy, except people weren't allowed to vote. And people that were allowed to vote didn't have the economic means to vote. People that had the money, which is true today even more so, had an inordinate amount of influence over electoral power. So these two Harvard professors who came to academic life during the Reagan uh, Clinton era, which was a pretty bankrupt era, they have nothing to offer to explain the richness of democracy. That's the richness of our democracy, or of any democracy. What uh, Ardian and, and, and uh, the Hungarian uh, president and uh, Bel Bel Bolsonaro and these other Duterte, what they have in common is that they are reacting against the system a system that was, uh, and so people voted these things in. They voted these people in. You know, that's that's the contradiction that these two these two uh, thinkers can't explain. And that is, how can a democratic structure produce a Trump, produce a Bolsonaro, and so on and so forth? How can it do that? It does it because that system isn't working. Well, okay, let me push back a little bit. The, the other point that they made. That, that that I think is germane to the diminishment of democracy is this idea that when societies lose the control of norms, the power of norms, uh, that that's when you start to have difficulty. And they mentioned two. One is mutual toleration. So that means that even though I lost the election, even though my opponent is now in power and I'm not, I, it, it, I, I, I consider my opponent my rival, not my enemy, not this horrible person that has um, no redeeming values at all. So that's this mutual toleration. The second is institutional forbearance. That's the second concept. And that is that in democracies, there are kind of unwritten rules. Like we could always pack the Supreme Court. We could, um, you know, change the Senate rules. But there's always the, these kind of guardrails that suggest I will keep myself in check because it's sometimes I will lose power and I don't want to have this happen to me. Be, be nice to the friends on the way up. You might need them on the way down. And they seem to indicate that beginning with Newt Gingrich and the way in which he turned this to where it wasn't just your enemy, it wasn't just your opponent, it was the, the you know, the, the language that he used to describe liberals and, and we're seeing that now in the Congress now in spades. This is, you know, what was the Georgia election about? The Georgia election was about, oh, you're going to elect socialists that are going to destroy our country and um, you know, there was there and and that's what the Democrats are all about. They're going to spend all of your money, give it away to poor people and turn us into a Venezuela. And that's not too much of an exaggeration to suggest how that mutual tolerance was not just you aren't just my opponent. There's no black and white here. So, you know, I guess I was taken in by I think that's correct. You know, democracies used to die by the gun. Now they die from within and they die by a deterioration of norms that generally speaking allow a cohesion of society to function and to have semblances of democracy. What do you say about that? Well, imagine a, a narrative, a story that begins with Newt Gingrich and says from Newt Gingrich on, things got out of line, we got off the guardrails, we lost our norms, we didn't have mutual respect. That story by these professors ignores the prior period the Cold War period from 1945 until Newt Gingrich till 1991, in which if you were a leftist, a left liberal in the 50s, a communist for sure in the 50s, you were an outlier, you were outside the guardrails. And to argue that that's when incivility and not respecting opponents and not showing tolerance for other political views started is to, is to show an incredible ignorance of American history. An ignorance that totally disregards McCarthyism and how it pushed people out of political life, how it pushed 
that's the kind of uh, political structure that we want. That's uh, their illustration of democracy is, is pretty embarrassing to me. So you don't think that there has been a... I mean, they want... I mean, I, you, you don't think that the shift in the past few years or the shift in the way the Republicans dealt with Obama by you know, negotiating with them for a year and a half on the Affordable Care Act and then not getting one single vote, the the way in which the, the you know, there's just this, this absolute cohesion of intolerance and treating your opponent as the enemy, that that is, I mean, certainly we're, we've never been perfect, but don't, do you think that there is a degree of um, I guess an increase of these these features that are problematic, according to these fellows, in in keeping democracies afloat. Well, yeah, no, I mean there definitely uh, has been tensions between the Democrats and the Republicans in that era, but it's kind of much ado about nothing. I mean they 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 uh, uh, they weren't fighting over anything really of substance in that period, and. Uh, a lack of civility. Well, I mean, American history has been all the important democratic motion movement in, in our history have been based on incivility, based upon not respecting your opponent and saying, I'm not going to tolerate business as usual, whether it's a civil war, whether it's the anti war movement, whether it's a civil rights movement, whether it's the construction of the uh, uh, militant unionism in the 1930s, all of those are considered outliers to these two authors by their own criteria. All of those are considered uh, to be a lack of civility, a lack of tolerance. Those people that went into factories in, in Detroit to organize auto workers and the sit down strikes were massive acts of incivility and they disrespected the rule of law and the norms of society. It's the only way they could have organized those unions given the way those norms were against them, leaning against them. The missing ingredient of all this talk is inequality. They never discuss inequality. There's two and a half pages of the entire book on inequality, which is, it would seem to me, the driving force that motivates and moves people to take action to change things in this country. And they almost always have to do it, whether it's segregation in the South, whether it's a war, an unjust war, they have to do it outside of those norms. And they consider that undemocratic. I'm, I'm just shocked to, to, to read a book that puts those kind of actions, which are central to, to democratizing America, outside of the pale. It shocks right. me. Right. Well, let me let me argue in your favor a little bit here. You know, wh what do we mean by d democracy? And and when you look at some of the changes that have occurred in our country with the um, the laws that gave billionaires the right of you know the, the, the considering their their right to speech and then corporations the right to speech and then citizens united um, and you know all of those things have created a situation where the oligarchs those with power and money are, controlling really what's what's going on in our legislative outcome. And, you know, there's that, that study in 2014 by uh, Gillens and Page where they looked at what the people want and what the money interest want and how the money interest increasingly are yeah. owning democracy. Now, there, there's, a, there's some questions regarding that uh, that study there's been some better studies following it but in just that's true yeah so if 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 keeping democracy in line in order to allow those features to thrive then you know the, democracy is not it might not be dying but it sure is rotting you know it sure is it's stinking um so that's one thing that i think they they had problems, they had problems with is what do we really mean by the people's voice and what we would consider traditional democracy? You know, we have a group group of voters that want something, they vote for it, they bring representatives there and laws are passed and that's what happens. That's not what, that's not what's, what's happening, correct? 
Exactly. No, it's not what's happening. And it, it, it hasn't been happening for a long time. I think that's what's missing in this book because it is essentially an anti-Trump book. And I think uh, uh, you can be anti-Trump. There's plenty of things to talk about Trump about. But then to miss the overview of the direction this country has been going in for some time, especially in terms of inequality and its consequences, the things you talked about, I mean, they've been, they have, they have been a rot on democracy. The inequality has been a rot on democracy because it's put so much power in the hands of people with enormous amounts of money to do things. That's mm -hmm. number one. The other thing is missing in the book is perhaps the most undemocratic uh, aspects of our life in the 21st century since 2001 and 9-11. There's been the total uh, mutual agreement between both parties to basically spy on us as Americans. And that's pretty shocking. And it's certainly inconsistent with any notion of democracy that I've ever read about, that people in a country are spied upon and are, are influenced dramatically based on that spying and you're being watched all the time. That's hardly a component of democracy to me. Right, right. So we have much to complain about in terms of our democracy and much to improve, but notions like gatekeepers, they, they that which is, of course is, a, is central, central in this book, that notion suggests to me keeping ideas out, not democracy, which allows ideas in. Yeah. And I guess to my final complaint, I did have some complaints about the book. Um, well, before I get to my complaints, I want to follow up with what you just said. I probably was intoxicated by another hit job on Trump because I just don't <laughs> like Trump so much. Sure, of course. And, you know, and it just gives me a, uh, it, it, I guess I'm prone to Trump derangement syndrome like anybody else. And, and I think that's probably my, my problem with the book now that I'm looking back and seeing it is that I was so excited to see another book on tyranny, another book on, you know, how this authoritarian is going to be screwing things up and how these historians are showing us and giving us the roadmap that I didn't, uh, I didn't look maybe as critically as I should at some of the bigger issues, the 30,000 feet above the ground level issues like you're, you're doing. Yeah, and here's my other criticism of the book, I guess, if I had two criticisms, is that they are looking at these historic events and trying to predict what's going on right now with this historic events. And frankly, you know, there's, um, you know, it's like the originalist with the Constitution, <laughs> with the Constitution. Uh, you know, what did the founding fathers think about the internet? You know, you know, we have uh, a a whole uh, you know, democracies, as I see it, need a free press. They need correct information. That's gone. You know, that's that's not. Uh, people are having difficulty getting their information. Uh, you're having a consolidation of media to five companies. You have the richest man in the world owning, you know, the Washington Post and actively using that for his purposes. So, um, I. I, th I think that they didn't spend enough time to see what are the features, what are these other features that are contemporary, maybe in the last couple of decades, that are also diminishing the ability to democracy for democracy to function properly. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think you're uh, you're right on. I think that's that's the missing ingredient in this is it it takes a very very narrow, a very uh, partisan view of democracy. If it's partisan for anything, it's partisan for uh, the views of a upper middle class liberal Democrat. And uh, uh, that's not the whole story. I mean, there's much more to that in this country than just upper middle class liberal Democrats. Um, you have to wrestle with the problem of Trump. The problem is that Trump was not the candidate of our ruling class. Big money was not behind Trump in 2016. In fact, it was behind Hillary, Hillary Clinton. And so he was an outlier from the beginning himself. And so you can go after Trump because he should have never been president, of course. But you have to try to understand what happens when everybody goes against Trump, what it means uh, when everybody goes against Trump. And what that led, led to, led directly to, was a situation where uh, 
U.S. liberals were uh, creating a Trump anti-Trump alliance with center and right forces in the Republican Party, the so-called Lincoln Republicans and, right. and the uh, uh, neoliberal uh, coal warriors uh, from the Republican Party. And so in this book, you get this uh, animus against Venezuela, against Cuba, against all these countries which are our enemies. You know, they're not my enemy, but they're our enemies. And liberals don't attack that. When they write about the book, none of these four pages of endorsements so I like the book, but it goes after U.S.'s, the U.S.'s uh, uh, quote unquote enemies, the ruling class's enemies in this country. So we ought to look at Venezuela. We ought to take a really clear look and say, what, what does it mean to say that's authoritarian? Their elections have been more fair than ours. They've been less influenced by money than ours. Uh, they have uh, involved and engaged more new voters than ours do. They've been certified by leading people around, but we didn't like the results of those elections. And we fought it and we put money into influencing those elections. And yet the book just shrugs and says, well, authoritarian, where's the authoritarianism? I mean, I need to see where that is. I don't see it there now. But people that read this book, I think were easily seduced into going along with that program because it was building an anti-Trump coalition. But we don't need we don't need to mislead people to get Trump out. He's out now. We need to now start thinking about building the kind of coalition, the kind of uh, movement that can strengthen this country and strengthen our democracy and strengthen social justice and do away with inequality so a uh, Trump won't arise again, a phony right wing populist like Trump. And if we don't do that, we're going to get another phony right wing right. populist that talks the same lingo and appeals to the same dissatisfied people that are, lose their homes, are evicted, lose their jobs, all of which is going on right now and aren't getting good medical uh, care. Those people are gonna, again, look at options. Right. And it isn't gonna be a Joe Biden unless Joe Biden does something or a Kamala Harris unless Kamala Harris does something. What do you think of that? I mean, how well, are you gonna get Trump you're out? Is, you're saying they wrote the, it's the wrong book. It's not how democracies die. It's how authoritarians are birthed. Yeah. That you know the Good. where I saw it as a reaction to Trump. Trump isn't really the problem. Uh, Trump is just a symptom of uh, dysfunction in society, and that they're 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 trying to keep together a a system that would stop another Trump from happening without looking at why did Trump happen? Trump didn't yeah. happen because of Newt Gingrich. You know, Trump happened because uh, young you know the percentage of income that is going to um, a smaller a, a smaller and smaller group of people is just is is growing exponentially. You know, it's just. Yeah. And yes, um, yes. so, and again, I think, yeah, maybe I, maybe I am a little deluded with Trump derangement syndrome and that uh, clouded my, uh, clouded my perceptions because that, you know, things aren't, uh, things aren't going very well. And I don't know if we're going to get out of that uh, situation without looking at some more systematically or for some of the causes of why things aren't going very well, so. Well, I mean, how can you have a democracy, a mature democracy, with a two-party system? I mean, how, how can you have that? Does that capture all of the political sentiment in this country? I mean, I don't think so. I don't know how it could, uh, particularly when those two parties are dominated by money right. and lobbyists and corporations. So my question would be, uh, if, if you want to talk about democracy, which we should talk about, we have to go beyond this book and we have to ask questions about the two-party system, the influence of money uh, on politicians, the uh, uh, necessity of big money to run for office. I mean, my God, this was a multi-billion dollar election. How's that a dem democracy? I mean, how can anybody run that isn't already part of, quote unquote, an establishment uh, when you have that kind of money behind it? Uh, so, I, I mean, I think there are really serious questions about democracy dying, but they're really left out of this book, unfortunately. Right. right. 
And uh, I, I mean, I don't have all the answers, but I think I know where to look. And I don't think these uh, these two writers uh, even tried to look in those areas. Yeah. Well, Greg, it's been fun chatting with you today. Let's do this again in a week or two, okay? Let's do it again in a couple of weeks. And uh, yeah, and thanks for thanks for giving me some feedback and making me think a little differently on things. And uh, that's always useful. Well, thanks for the book suggestion. I did enjoy reading it, however. I didn't like it, but I enjoyed reading it because it gave me a picture of what's going on. I get sometimes buried in my own narrow, very left reading list. And I, I need to know more about what others are saying. I know a few books you've sent me and recommended. I've learned a great deal. I look forward to uh, discussing them as well. And and I'm, who knows, I may defend some of the books you recommend and you may, you may attack them. Okay, good. All right, thank you, we'll see you. Good seeing you, Pat, bye-bye.